point, uh, Dan, Dan uh, Nadrino has been involved, I think, since he was in diapers with <laughs> reptiles and amphibians. I can relate to that. I had a son who's not really involved with reptiles, but at that age, we'd hear the screen door slam, and he'd come in, and then the screen door would slam when he went out because he had found a toad out in the sandbox, and he brought it in for a while and then took it back out. And uh, those of you that know our son know that he's still interested in nature in many, many ways, though he hasn't focused on the herbs. Uh, I don't want to go into the whole background with Dan. I want to get going with Crowley. So Dan, let's welcome you. Okay, I'm wondering maybe if we can can the lights a little bit so we can get the color intensity. And then the next thing I'd like to mention is too that uh, yeah, I, I, it took me a little longer than the diaper stage, but by the time I was in third grade, I did know I wanted to be a herpetologist, and the main reason at the time was there weren't any dinosaurs left. So all the reference books, I thought, hey, reptiles are the closest thing. And, and once I found out about sea turtles and how large crocodilians might get and supposed 30-foot anacondas in South America, <laughs> etc., it got more and more interesting. and. Uh, being an animal person by far, far more than a people person, it just sort of came natural. And one thing led to another. We did the fishing trips with the socially accepted uh, activities that grandparents and parents do with their kids. And, and all my cousins got interested in following along. And the next thing you know, we were actually hunting rattlesnakes by ninth grade in high school. Uh, this obviously isn't a rattlesnake. It's a, it's a what? Thank you. But what kind? Who knows? I can tell you what the Latin name used to be, and they might have changed it. There's so much flux right now in the taxonomy. Common snapper. Very good. Okay, and that would be an aquatic animal. But surprisingly, it's amazing to see the extreme movements that so many of our wild species utilize to go from point A to point B. I had a, a large adult beaver travel across the ridge in the town that I live in this summer. And it had no business being where it was, but it was obviously moving from one stream valley to another. Next. Uh, reptiles, of course, are significantly different from the amphibians, but they hold a lot of characteristics that are similar. They crawl on their bellies, hence the term herpes, or Greek word meaning crawl. And incidentally, these animals are still mysterious to most, because like a bird, when you just get a flash of feathers and you're like, ice stripe, wing bar, uh, habitat, uh, season, uh, you know, and you're working through, okay, gray-sided, red-cheeked, whatever, depending on what state you're in or what state you're in. But anyway, here we have a situation <laughs> with frogs that show all kinds of variants in their ability to be spotted. Is it a regular northern leopard frog? Was it a pickerel frog? Was it a aberrant? Or was it actually a weird looking big frog? So things can happen real quick, and binoculars can really be helpful when you see those basking creatures there. Uh, or hopefully finding the specimen. And of course, with these animals, you can pick them up and grab them gently, hopefully. Leopard frogs used to be one of our most widespread species, but it's being replaced by our green frogs. Next. Uh, 12. That seems to be the magic number for the species of frogs and turtles and mice and even owls, obviously, associated with the state when you add them all up with the Arctic influence. Um, here we have a what? Who knows this Chorus frog. Chorus frog. Okay. We have actually two now. They're considered two different species, our boreal and our western. And some of the big differences are coloration, but I'm sure the chemical differences and the chemistry and the adaptations and all the things we don't know yet between the two groups of frogs are pretty amazing. And of course, as we know, species can actually be something that becomes different with two different geographical races that separate so long that they start to take on different physical characteristics and perhaps many others. Next. And that's one of our spring breeders that comes out first along with our spring peepers. And it, just for fun, it would be nice to get a few frog calls in the audience. So and I'm sure many of you are very, very familiar with all these, but some might not be. So for their benefit, I'm thinking perhaps we can 
nail some frog claws. So this one's a what? Spring pea green. And it sounds a little bit like. So on the count of three, I'm hoping everybody can uh, pop a whistle. Let's we'll see what happens. One, two, three, go! Very good. Richard, Dr. Dr. Richard, yeah, round of applause. That was nice. Years ago, Dr. Richard Vogt told me he thought he had a new species, but it was just a spring pea for calling the beer can. Uh, some of the crawls that some of these animals make are amazing. And I've had wildlife biologists tell me there are wood frogs in that valley. And I go down there and there's some really aberrant, weird pickerel frog calls. Or there's other things, and there's some, there's just some variations that sometimes have you scratching your head. And I'm sure so much of it depends upon the temperature and perhaps maybe the sound resonance from the location from where they call, all the rain, all those things. A couple other calls for you. Here's one, the wood frog. We'll see a picture in a moment. Black mask. I've seen them almost purplish in Trumpelow County. Brown, tan, we see reddish, orange, gray, almost always a dark black or dark gray or dark brown mask, like a raccoon, that'd be the field mark. And I'd like to have all the girls here, moms, gals, daughters, on the count of three go, quack, 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 quack. And I'd like to have all the guys go, cluck, 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 cluck. So just remember what sex you are and we should be able to pull this off. So on the count of three, one, two, three, wood frog. Oh, that was pro. Good job. Yes. All right. Um, habitat. All right. Well, what's going on here? Basically, this could be a, an example of succession that's going on in certain habitats where we don't want a lot more vegetation. For example, vertical prairies or goat prairies and some of the river bluffs, some of the wet meadows, some of the... There's a lot of these animals that need delicate areas and they're species specific and they're only capable to live in certain small locations that are proper for them. Fens, bogs perhaps. Some example species we have that are endangered include our eastern or actually northern ribbon snake, our western ribbon snake, our glass lizard, our ornate fox turtle. In the case of succession being a problem, our timber rattlesnakes are being wiped out simply, obviously development of the blobs, obviously a hatred of snakes, but also their habitat starting to fill in with other kinds of vegetation. So the light rays where you get the heat for the solar and the thermoregulation is really often minimal sometimes. Next. Something to think about. So quite often you can see the animals actually laying in there. Uh, obviously, the heavy forests contain some of your favorite subjects, and these are who? Anyone? Red hogs? No. Red hogs? Red cooper hogs? These are gods. Red flags? Uh, these are fledgling gum stuff. And they were flying that day, and they always kind enough to lead me to the Black River State Forest to see those. But anyways, it's interesting because now we have so many raptors that are doing so well along with our waders, such as the sand hill crane, of course our great blue herons, our egrets, and all these animals are doing incredible, but they also are eating frogs, salamanders. I was over at the Crane, crane Foundation one day and one of the captive cranes reaches down, boom, there goes a the tiger salamander. And of course a lot of our herps are locally abundant. But again, they don't have the mobility that so many are, are um, arboreal or air, aerial species have. Next. And so a lot of our critters are being hit from all sides. And what species of frog? <coughs> Wood frog. Okay, very, very good. You can see the, the mask right there. Wood frogs, I find, are interesting because of the fact that they, the, one of the things about them that is amazing to me is that they're explosive spring breeders. And there's about a three-week period where they just blast. But if the environmental conditions aren't right, it's too cold, they don't do it. They'll wait till next year. Next. So some of these animals are really suppressed by the weather or whatever. Um, appreciation for, pardon me as I walk over here, but uh, the appreciation for a lot of these animals varies with people. And part of what I've been doing in my life is trying to bring nature to the classroom. 
and it's really nice to see people enjoy them. Obviously, if everybody picks up the same frog, that can be very difficult for the frog, or possibly even fatal. So we have to be careful. We can't use pesticides on our hands and pick up amphibians. That might take them out. It might take out really small reptiles, too. Um, but I think we treat certain animals differently than we would treat a cute little gray tree frog. So but now the question is, why? Next. So obviously, the more we know about these animals, or people, or places, or things, probably the more interesting they become and the less fearful we might be. So, uh, gray tree frogs were always one of my favorites. And I can remember being in a Boy Scout camp, and we were in the pond, and all of a sudden there's this weird looking frog. And one of my friends caught it, and they hit a big snake that was unidentified at the Boy Scout camp. It turned out to be a northern water snake, but I didn't realize that for another five years. And they fed the gray tree frog for it, to it. And I felt very uncomfortable with that at the time, but nature is nature. And fortunately, there are many, many gray tree frogs that live really very well. Next. Uh, some of the things that are amazing about them is you can put them on glass, put them on screen, put them on the <coughs> They're just virtually everywhere. And there are different niches between the two species of tree frogs that occur in the state. And there are different ways to determine whether it's a copse or a common <coughs> western tree frog versus color. But it turns out that the copse has got a little smoother skin and there's a blood difference, but also the calls. And of course, only the guy frogs call. I'm not going to try to attempt a great tree frog call. Next. The copse is on the right, and the versicolor is on the left, and they're, these are two big females. Incidentally, many of the larger frogs are females. That's true with our toad as well. And a lot of these animals are exceeding longevity uh, records that we thought we knew about. In other words, well, they lived to be 20 years. All of a sudden, here's one that's 27 years old. All of a sudden, here's something that's 32 years old. We have a Blanding's turtle lay fertile eggs at age 75. So some of those old white scales might actually be, maybe you should be taken a little more serious as we develop more information long term. Next. Uh, and again, only the males call. And obviously, there are some territorial concerns, habitat concerns, space concerns. So you do have a dominant male. And then you have a, say, a another male may be waiting behind. They don't all call sporadically. There seems to be a system. Of course, the frog specialist can give you the ratios, and, and it's amazing what you can find on Google. We'll keep going. These are Cope's gray tree frogs, and uh, I'm just going to say that with external fertilization and amplexus, it's amazing because sometimes you see all these unusual pictures about where a male frog or toad might have the wrong variety of friend or mate. And there's all kinds of chemical stimulus going on, and I'm sure we just know a tiny percentage of what there is to know in the frog world, probably in the ant world, in the bird world, etc. So it's just wonderful to see so many people excited and interested in developing more information on that. Thank you. Next. You can tell by the turn off the night. It's fun. Uh, one of the things that's also interesting about the frogs is how in the world can they survive with all those a lot of tadpoles? And it's obviously a game of numbers, but they have to be careful where they lay the eggs because of fish. And fish are going to eat the eggs. And of course, um, turtles are going to eat the eggs. And fur bearers are going to eat the eggs. I'm sure certain birds eat the eggs. And then insects as well. So. Um, there's just some places where wholesale frogs get wiped out because of the lack of reproduction in places where maybe the pond dried up or, or people interfered and took out the wetland or whatever. But luckily, most of our species have capability to make a comeback. Next. So as we develop our habitats and maintain our incredible wildlife diversity that Wisconsin's known for, and that's currently why so many people are continue to come and visit because we have an incredible state. Um, our amphibian populations seem to be doing very well. And if you check in with Mike Mossman and the gang down at the DNR, uh, they, are, they have numerous species that are actually on the upswing. Unfortunately, it's not the leopard frog, but our greens are doing well, our gray tree frogs, and our American toads, for example. Next. 
Fishies? Anybody? Green frog. Green frog. Frog. Bull. Bull. Okay. Very good. Male or female? Female, I think. You're right. It's a female. Okay. The males have a much larger tympanum or ear membrane. And incidentally, the males, again, are the only guys that fall. Because the yells don't fall. Why are they calling? They. Okay. They're looking for girlfriends. Then you're looking at different kinds of calls, right? Okay, yeah, so here's, a, here's an example of a bullfrog, at my best ability. It's a little different than the green frog. It's a little bit like this. No, 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 no. And the first time I heard that, I went and hit the car and locked the doors. <laughs> green frogs seem a little more of Homer Simpson like, kind of a boom, boom, boom. So, thank you. All right. The one I'd like to have you guys do is the leopard frog. So, if you can just imagine a friend, if your partner, family member, might be the guy that lives across the street that's got a lot of dogs. Anyway, somebody who is really good at snoring. I'd like to hear your best example of somebody snoring for, to represent leopard frog. So, on the count of three, don't hurt yourself. Please rev up your engines and let her fly. One. Two, three, go. Well, it's a quiet group. Thank you. All right, next. I'm sorry, everybody. Okay, and this is Toad. And some of the grandmothers of the gardens. Uh, toads are obviously universal because of the thick skins, which also applies to the great tree frogs. And so virtually every habitat have toads and great tree frogs. Some of the more slender-skinned frogs, uh, specifically the cricket frogs in the southern 38 counties, are formerly so, and the pickerel frogs are much more of what we'll call an ecological indicator. And so they're not going to be found all over the place. But we're, I live down south of La Crosse, so we have plenty of trout streams in the Driftless area, and we fortunately have plenty of pickerel frogs. They seem to dominate over the leopards. Um, once you get to the river systems, then you see your leopard frogs. Next. And I'm not going to imitate a toad either. I'm sure somebody else can do a much better job. It's a little bit like... I'm not good at that. Is there anybody here that can nail that for me? Metamorphosis, obviously, and the differences between the eggs and the incubation times and all that good stuff. Usually, six weeks is going to take care of a tadpole if it's a spring peeper or a toad or a gray tree frog. Uh, you get these ephemeral ponds to dry up real quick, so we lose some of our woodland amphibians, but most of them, I think, do a pretty good job with mom selection. But we've even got gray tree frogs laying eggs in puddles in trails maybe a tractor tire puddle or something like that. So they're pretty darn amazing little creatures. Next. However, there is predation going on. And because of the massive numbers of hundreds of thousands of little froglets and toadlets and tadpoles uh, from both amphibian varieties or orders, uh, the salamanders and the frogs or neurons, um, here we have an example of a water bug that just nailed a spotted salamander larva. Next. Aww. Speaking of salamanders, seven species in the state. Several pictures I don't have include the four toad and the mud buggy. And I do have them, I just didn't include them today, but most of them, as you might guess, are named after the way they look, so this is the what? Thank you. And quite common in the Portage County area, and actually throughout most of the Wisconsin, and the most widespread land or terrestrial salamander of the state. Next. And many call it the yellow spotted. Officially, it's not a lot of the yellow, the, the spotted. Uh, these were really interesting because when I first got into this seriously, they were being considered a threatened species or worse. But as we learned more about them, we found they were quite common in the pine woods. And fortunately, uh, they seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, but again, they're locally abundant in some areas where you'd swear it's perfect habitat for this and it may or may not occur. And why certain populations do well and others don't, who knows. 
to be, to be continued. Next. <clears throat> Our notes. And uh, these guys are real interesting and secretive as well, and quite often found in ponds, usually associated not far from river systems. Um, amazing in that we get the little red Fs. They do change and have a land stage. I also think that the young ones can uh, handle being dried up a little earlier than usual than expected and handle that as well. So again, you have a thick-skinned amphibian that can handle and tolerate terrestrial or land conditions. Next. So this is who? Red back. And these are lung salamanders, like our four-toed. And incidentally, do not go through a metamorphosis like all the other guys and gals. And one of the shots that Al and I are still trying to get is a female with eggs and they have all these little faces in the eggs looking out at us. And that would be quite fun when we were able to get that photograph. Uh, a lot of individual variation on these. Sometimes you get very dark ones, but for not typically. Typically they're more orange or reddish. And, and then the uh, hemlock forests and some of the deciduous forests in the north. <laughs> and our tiger. We get blondes, brunettes, and redheads with these. Some almost orange, some yellow, some very, very, very dark. And again, salamanders. Tiger salamanders are being outlawed in many states now because of the fishing bait industry or commercial take. And pretty soon, if you've got amphibians that aren't supposed to be there in places that are quite massive in their destruction of other amphibians, and tigers are, along with bullfrogs. And of course, bullfrog tadpoles are probably what you're going to get when you're restocking ponds and, oh, let's say, golf courses, etc. So we have to be careful when we lay these aggressive species out in other areas that might be more delicate. And uh, <coughs> so we're not really even sure what the actual distribution is of bullfrogs in Wisconsin because so many have been farmed out into, into uh, local ponds. So just a thought. So hopefully when you do catch or keep an animal for whatever reason, when you release it, please release it where you catch it, because they do home just like birds. Next. Okay, big difference. Incubation time on eggs of turtles, 47 days or more. Sometimes 60, sometimes 100. I was surprised to hear 100. Again, the value of these creatures helping to knock out pests, such as rodents, is often overlooked. Next. Our trying to just thermoregulate on the road, and hopefully the day will come when people actually drive around these creatures rather than trying to take them out in their four wheelers. Next. Our timber railer again with a black tail. Next. <coughs> a reminder that many species will eat rattlesnakes, including opossums, which I'm told are new to the venom. I'm not going to go over snake bite remedies or what to do if you're bitten because you really have to be unlucky to be bitten. And with Massasaugas, nobody's ever been killed in the United States. We had one mortality in Canada and Wisconsin. We've had 18 mortalities of people in white-tailed deer, non-auto related. We've had one person in the state killed by a rattler that I know of. Uh, we've had one person in the state killed by a duck. That I know of. <laughs> <laughs> From what I understand, and I don't know if this is true, but I was also told somebody was taken out by a bluegill. So, <laughs> just make sure, and I'm not sure, again, I haven't checked this, I should. I'm told that people have been killed more by strawberries and venomous snakes on junior food. And we have this incredible place, and I'm hoping you're enjoying it as much as I am. That's the end of the slides, thank you very much. of a Massasauga, and I've got one of that. Okay, very good. One of those were the timber railers as well, and just numerous biodiversity pictures of reptiles and amphibians. I'm just going to set this over here, and that's something, yeah, you like that, don't you? And, I'm, and uh, we're going to have some live animals out, have a table out, and available for questions and answers if they have any. Reminder to it, we want everybody comfortable, so please don't feel pressured 
to touch anything you don't want to. Most of the creatures are very easy access and easy to work with. However, they vary. Some of them are a little more unusual than 